ओके गुड इवनिंग एवरीबॉडी आई एम डॉक्टर प्रोफेसर पी सी मनोरिया डायरेक्टर मनोरिया हार्ट एंड क्रिटिकल केयर हॉस्पिटल भोपाल आई एम ऑल्सो पास प्रेजिडेंट कार्डियोलॉजिकल सोसाइटी ऑफ इंडिया एंड पास प्रेजिडेंट एसोसिएशन ऑफ फिजिशियन ऑफ इंडिया दी टॉपिक फॉर टूडे इज वॉर अगेंस्ट हार्ट फेलियर द न्यू वेपन इन द आमरी the statistics for heart failure are horrifying throughout the globe the topic for today is war against the the statistics for heart failure are horrifying throughout the globe in the indian context we have about 8 to 10 million patients with heart failure that is about 1% of the adult populations what is very very distressing is india has a relatively young population of heart failure about 22% are below the age of 30 years and 14.9% above the age of 50 years the post hospital admission mortality is also high 20 to 30% medical medication adherence ranges from 25 to 50% and what is very very distressing is the incidence of diabetes in heart failure in the trivandrum heart failure registry is to the tune of 50% to be accurate 54.9% which means half of the patient of heart failure are diabetics what is also very important to understand is that heart failure one sets in runs a malignant progression with a very high morbidity and mortality the five year mortality in heart failure is to the tune of 50% a figure higher than most of the malignant lesions why progression in heart failure continues unabated there are several reasons firstly even in patients with stable heart failure myocardial apoptosis continues unabated which can be seen as elevations persistent low level elevations of troponin c and cardiac function may deteriorate silently and the patient may get admitted with heart failure one in four patients with heart failure with reduced ejection section with mild symptoms die or is hospitalized within 3 years in one in four patients of hep rep the first manifestation is worsening of heart failure or sudden death all of us know heart failure is also a very bad arrhythmogenic potential and you can see sudden cardiac death which occurs unexpectedly in 66% in class 2 and 33% in class 4 patient which means as the heart failure progresses the probability of patient dying from sudden cardiac death decreases and therefore chronic heart failure should never never be considered a stable disease it has always malignant progression pharmacotherapy which we utilize in our day to day therapy only blunts this malignant progression and does not arrest it when you look at the evolution of therapies for patients with heart failure we have the pre sequitral valsartan era from 1980 to 2014 prior to the 1980s the treatment of heart failure was mainly non pharmacological we had only digoxin and diuretics 1980s was a hemodynamic decade we have vasodilators and inotropes both the drugs they were useful but they did not decrease the mortality of heart failure 
90s was a neurohormonal decade with RAS blockers and beta blockers. Both these drugs are very useful in the treatment of heart failure with reduced action fraction, and both of them decreases mortality. 2000, we had the device era, ICD, CRT, LVAD, and MRAs were also approved for heart failure in 2003. And 2010 onwards, kicked off the cellular era with cell therapy and gene therapy, which is still in the process of evolution. Secuvetril valsartan era erupted in 2014 after the Paragdim HF trial, which was a historical trial. And following this, RNA, which is Secuvetril valsartan, was approved for clinical use in HEPREP in 2016. And the Pioneer HF trial in 2019, it was approved for acute D acute ADHF also. So we have four pillars of heart failure with reduced action fraction, ACE, oblique ARB, beta blockers, MRAs, and RD. 2019 initiated dawn of a new era with DAPA HF trial being presented. SGLT2 inhibitors, including DAPA, as you know, all of them were approved for decreasing hospitalization for heart failure and diabetics by all guidelines. But after the DAPA HF trial, it was approved for heart failure, reduced ejection fraction treatment, both for diabetics as well as non diabetic. So now, at the present state of time, we have five pillars for heart failure treatment and DAPA was the fifth pillar for treatment of HEPREP. Secubitril valsartan and DAPA is the first SGLT2 inhibitor which has smashed the boundary between diabetics and non-diabetics and DAPA has opened a new pathway of heart failure management. The drug was approved for the first time in 2019 itself by the Canadian Cardiovascular Society and by ACCAHA in 2020 and is also approved uh, by the ESC guidelines. Rather, it is globally approved. The symptoms of heart failure for a layman are cough, shortness of breath, which is more in lying down, which we termed as orthopnea, distension of abdomen, tiredness, and swelling over legs. From the point of view of management, we categorize heart failure into three subsets. Heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, where the ejection fraction is less than 40%. Heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, where the ejection fraction is more than 50%. And we have a heart failure with mid-range ejection, where the ejection fraction is between 40 to 49%. Now, the heart failure has been categorized into four stages. Stage one heart failure is when the patient has only risk factor for heart failure, but no signs and symptoms of heart failure. And stage two, he's a structural heart disease, but no symptoms or signs of heart failure. This classification is particularly designed in mind that prevention of heart failure can be executed in stage A and B. Stage C, the patient starts getting symptoms. And stage D is refractory heart failure, which requires special treatment. And therefore, prevention and prevention should be the first goal in our management of patients of heart failure. Another thing we must understand very carefully is Every hospitalization, every re-hospitalization for heart failure takes the patient closer to death. So if a drug in question is able to prevent hospitalization or delay hospitalization, this is indeed a great achievement. Now, what are our goals of management of uh, chronic heart failure? Relief of symptoms which should improve the functional capacity and the quality of life, reducing mortality and reversing 
the slowing, the progressive structural abnormality of left ventricle, which we term as remodeling. So our aim is reverse remodeling. Now, this is the landmark DAPA HF trial. As you can see, 4,700 patients, half prep, diabetics as well as non diabetics, ejection fraction less than uh, 40%, elevated serum markers, EGFR uh, more than 30, and all patients received the standard of uh, half prep treatment. The primary endpoint of the study was time to first occurrence of any of the components of composite that is cardiovascular death hospitalization for heart failure or an urgent hf visit this shows the baseline uh, characteristics and you can see all grades of heart failure are included two three four the ejection fraction mean is 31 percent serum markers are elevated antibrio vnp 1428 systolic blood pressure reasonable Ischemic as well as non ischemic etiology were included in this, and the EGFR, as you can see, 66, and both diabetics and non diabetics were included in the trial. Most of these patients were on standard care of therapy. In vast majority of patients, you can see uh, ACE or ARB 94%, beta blockers 96%, MRA 70%. So most of these patients were receiving optimum therapy and DAPA was tried on top of the standard care. And you can see the primary endpoint, which is a composite of cardiovascular death or hospitalization for heart failure or an urgent HF visit. There was a statistically significant reduction of 26%. And NNT, as you can see, is only 21 within a period of 18 months. When we look at the worsening of heart failure event, again, you can see there is a 30% reduction in this parameter. And when we look at cardiovascular death, again, you can see statistically significant 18% risk reduction in cardiovascular death. When we look at the subgroups, you can see NYHA class 2 as well as 3 benefited. The benefit was more in NYHA class 2. Prior hospitalization or no hospitalization, both subgroups benefited, but those who had prior hospitalization, they benefited more. Ischemic or non-ischemic does not matter. And whether you're a diabetic or a non-diabetic, the benefit was there. So the first big message from DAPA-HF trial was that dapa glucosin was useful both in diabetic patients as well as non-diabetic patients with HFREF. In other words, DAPA has smashed the boundary between diabetic heart failure and non-diabetic failure. And this is the first anti-diabetic medication which has been approved for treatment of HFREF in a diabetic patient besides non-diabetic. What was very interesting is that it also showed benefit on top of RD and the benefit was nearly the same whether you were receiving RNA or whether you were not receiving RNA. And it has opened a new pathway for heart failure. All drugs with decreased mortality in heart failure act through the neurohormonal blockade. This drug does not act through the neurohormonal blockade. It has a separate pathway or treatment of heart failure. And it is poised to change the definition of refractory heart failure. Whenever we have a patient of refractory heart failure, reduced ejection fraction, before labeling is that refractory, we always ask whether you have taken army or not. If you have not taken army, go and take army and come back. Now we'll be asking, have you taken DAPA or not? If not, please go and take DAPA and then come back. And many patients may improve without a device therapy. So it is poised to change the definition of refractory heart failure it is poised to postpone deviant therapy like CRT, LVAD, or even cardiac transplantation. When we look at the secondary endpoint of cardiovascular death and hospitalization for heart failure, there's a 25% reduction. And when we look at total HHF and CV death, again, you can see a 25% risk reduction. And all cause mortality also, as you can see, there's a 17% reduction in the all cause mortality. DAPA HF also decreased NT pro BNP level 
But what was very curious is the subsets which benefited most from DAPA were the subset which has least elevation of NT Brovian P, clearly indicating that DAPA has an independent pathway of benefiting uh, patients of heart failure, and which is indeed very, very exciting. When we look at the safe key of DAPA glyphosin, you can see it is a very safe molecule. Uh, most of the adverse effects are just like a placebo, so you can take it very safely. For example, if you look at the volume depletion, there is no statistically significant change whether you are on a DAPA or whether you are on a placebo. So volume depletion may occur, but is not seen in significant number of patients. Just as when we look at urinary tract and genital infections, again, you can see uh, there is not much difference uh, between the group receiving dapoglyphosin and the group receiving placebo. So what DAPA HF trial has taught us, it has passed on revolutionary message. This is the first trial of an SGLT2 inhibitor, which has shown benefit on top of standard care treatment, which means beta blockers, AC inhibitors, or ARBs, MRAs, and even RV. This is the first trial which has shown benefit in diabetic as well as non-diabetics. The cardiovascular death, the hospitalization for heart failure, all cause mortality, all were statistically decreased. It has shown benefit on top of our knee and is a safe molecule and can be used in our day-to-day -day practice. When we look at the mechanism of inhibition, or the mechanism of benefit in heart failure. There are multiple benefits, as you can see on the slide. It can produce netoresis. It improves the cardiac uh, bioenergetics. Mild persistent ketonemia, as we know, is an energy efficient superfuel. Reduction in interstitial edema, which I'll explain further. Inhibition of the sodium hydroxyl exchange, which is an important uh, modality for uh, uh, remodeling, and it also reduces preload and after roll and reduction in the uh, LV wall stress. And it also improves uh, renal and cardiac function. And this explains the mechanism of uh, renal benefits of uh, DAPA in patients with heart failure, because heart failure and kidney failure go hand in hand. If heart failure worsens, kidney failure will worsen. If kidney failure worsens, heart failure will worsen. And one of the very important mechanisms why DAPA provides nephroprotection is that it produces efferent arteriolar constriction so that the intraglobular pressure is reduced. And besides, it is also decreases blood pressure, plasma volume, afterload, preload, LV wall stress, and it also produces uh, glycoresis. Uh, this slide shows uh, the other mechanisms which are involved in its uh, beneficial effects. The kidney mechanism I've already talked of. There's also improvement in the myocardial bioenergetics. And I'm already talking to you that blocking NHE1 is uh, beneficial in patients with heart failure because if any EHE1 is increased, it produces cardiac uh, remodeling, which is detrimental to patients of heart failure. Now, how does SGL T2 inhibitors differ from diuretics? As we know, if you use uh, diuretics, they not only decrease the intravascular volume, but they also decrease the interstitial volume but unlike diuretics, SGLT2 inhibitors, they decrease interstitial uh, uh, volume 
which is of immense importance for cardiac function as well as renal function. So this is another one of the very important unique features of SGL T2 inhibitors. And when we talk of uh, the utility of uh, dapagliflozin in the continuum of heart failure in patients with diabetics, uh, you can see DAPA is useful throughout the continuum of heart failure. You can use it in stage one when patient has only risk factors for diabetes. And as you can see, it imparts three beneficial effects in stage one. The HbA1c is decreased, the body weight is decreased, the systolic blood pressure. You can also use in stage two heart failure when there is cardiac remodeling has set in, although the patient may be asymptomatic and is obviously used in stage three and four where it decreases hospitalization for heart failure, cardiovascular death and all cause mortality. Now this is uh, the AMPA heart study, which was carried out with AMPA glyphosin. And this shows positive results. It showed a meaningful reduction in the left volume mass index, clearly indicating that uh, SGLT2 inhibitors also produce reverse remodeling. What we were talking about for last uh, 30 minutes is all about heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. The second category of heart failure is heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And till date, all trials in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction has been flop trials. No trial has been positive in half pep, but there is expectation and there's a lot of hope that SGT2 inhibitors may show positive results in half pep. And there are several reasons for this. The first reason is in the declared to me 58, some patients of half pep are included and they have shown beneficial results. The second reason is that it decreases interstitial edema and experimental work has shown that if the interstitial edema is decreased, even in absence of regression of left ventricular myocardial function, the heart is able to relax better. And this may be the other reason why we believe that these trials may come out to be positive in hep -pep. And the third reason is DAPA acts through a new pathway for heart failure. All drugs which have failed in hep -pep act through the neurohormonal pathway. So based on this hypothesis, there's also in hope because this pathway has never been tested in hep -pep, it may come out to be positive. Several trials with various SGLT2 inhibitors are ongoing. The delivered trial with uh, DAPA. AMPA is also having trials with uh, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, and we are keenly awaiting the results of these trials. SGLT2 inhibitor, as you can see, DAPA has done the formidable task of improving cardiovascular outcome in half rep on top of all four pillars of treatment. The first pillar was ACEOI, beta blocker second, MRS third and RD. And when you use DAPA, it has shown benefit on top of all these four pillars of heart failure. And DAPA has become the fifth pillar of heart failure in two days scenario. And it is therefore a new weapon in our army to fight the devil of heart failure. All of us know SGLT2 inhibitors continue to surprise us. DAPA is the first SGLT2 inhibitor to show benefit in half prep in non diabetics as well as diabetic patients. We are keenly awaiting the results of SGLT2 inhibitors in half prep that is the delivered trial. Learning with SGLT2 inhibitor continues unabated and we are still learning. 
the DAPA CKD trial has also been prematurely terminated because of immense benefit and it has shown great benefit again in diabetics as well as non-diabetic patients. And what is also very interesting is that the new analysis from DAPA-HF has shown that 32% reduced risk of new onset diabetes and therefore this is again a new feather in the cap of DAPA. The widespread benefits of SGLT2 inhibitors have created feeling of possessiveness amongst the super specialists. SGLT2 inhibitor was introduced as an anti-diabetic medication and therefore the diabetologists think it is a drug of diabetologists and belong to their specialty. SGLT2 inhibitors, DAPA has shown beneficial effect in HEFREF both in diabetics and non-diabetic patients and therefore the cardiologists feel that it is their drug and it is the drug of the cardiologist. And its benefit in renal protection is unprecedented. It has changed the trajectory of CKD and it has slowed down the decline in EGFR by almost 40 to 45%. And it is a boon for patients of CKD and the nephrologists are very keen to use this drug and therefore they believe this is a drug of the nephrologist. But what is the solution to this? Our view is it is not a drug of any specialty, but it is a drug for the welfare of the patient. And that is the appropriate class where this drug should be put in. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Yes, right. Not yet. I will. Yes. The first question is Can DAPA be used in patients who are already receiving ARNI for HEF? HEF -REF? Uh, this is a question from Steffi. Hello? Heart failure. Steffi Dusosa. I think the DAPA HF very clearly shown that even if the patient is on ARNI, it has shown incremental benefit. So if you're already taking ARNI, you will have an incremental benefit on top of ARNI. And the reason is it acts through a different pathway then the other you know, hormonal blockers. Uh, the confidence interval was also very good. Only some uh, 10 or 11 percent is not more than that. And therefore, when we are using uh, DAPA in these patients, we will try to pick up those patients who have a little higher confidence interval than one. Is DAPA associated with hyperkalemia or decrease in blood pressure from Dr. Karamveer Agrawal? It is ARNI which is associated with hyperkalemia and decrease in blood pressure. The effect on DAPA on hyperkalemia or blood pressure is negligible. There may be mild reduction in blood pressure, but usually it does not come in way of initiating DAPA in patients with high pressure. Uh, Dr. Thapar, what are the results of drug therapy in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction? I've already told you no therapy till date has shown positive results in this subset of patients that is heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. We have lots of hope uh, from uh, DAPA for several reasons I've already pointed out. The first reason is 
it acts through a new pathway of heart failure which has never been tested in patients with hepatitis secondly some of the patients in declared to be 58 have hep rep and these patients who were given dapa they have shown beneficial effect and the third reason i have told you there is now experimental data that when we use sglt2 inhibitors due to decrease in the interstitial fluid the myocardial fibers are able to relax better there is improvement in the diastolic function so these are the reasons that uh, perhaps trials of uh, dapa in uh, hep pep may come out to be positive but this is the hope uh, the reality will come when deliver trial or empa uh, trial with uh, hep pep will be released but there's lots of hope for these two reasons just not a presumption there are reasons behind it why dapa may produce positive results Uh, there's question from uh, Kritika Khanna, which MRA you prefer in patients of heart failure, the tendency for hyperkalemia. Now you must always remember that heart failure and kidney failure are always coexisting. If heart failure increases, kidney failure will increase and vice versa. So these patients, they have a tendency for hyperkalemia. And if hyperkalemia occurs, uh, there's problem in using drugs for heart failure like MRAs or drugs for heart failure like ARNI. So if there is an anticipation that uh, patient will develop hyperkalemia, our choice for MRA is not aldecton but aprilenon. And the reason is the metabolites of aprilenon disappear in 12 to 24 hours, unlike aldecton, which takes four, five, or even six hours to disappear because aprilenone is a short-acting drug. So this is the reason if there's potential for hyperkalemia, we would like to prefer aprilenone rather than this so that we can easily stop the drug and reverse the hyperkalemic drugs, modify the dose, or you can use resins and other newer drugs like petromyer to combat hyperkalemia. But at attempts in heart failure, even there is hyperkalemia, we will treat hyperkalemia and try to use all these drugs although they have potential for like the MRAs, like Arni, will always try to use drugs and try to minimize hyperkalemia with several drugs and dietic restrictions. And if required, even dialysis. Yes, uh, Meera, you have asked a very interesting question. Is it possible to have heart failure without patient being aware of it? Very interesting stage a of heart failure no symptoms and signs stage b of heart failure no symptoms and signs i think most of the non-communicable diseases the problem is they do not produce symptoms. you may be severely diabetic type 2 you may not have symptoms you may have severe hypertension you may not have symptoms and the same applies for heart failure you can be in stage one and two and may not be aware that you are suffering from heart failure that's why i say prevention is very important and prevention uh, can be done in stage A and stage B heart failure, which means if you have a risk factor of heart failure, treat it, you will not develop heart failure. If there is a structural mod uh, remodeling in heart failure, try to improve it by drugs, RAS blockers, ARNI, and uh, even the SGLT2. But this is true. Uh, this is uh, Mr. Bhaskar. Uh, can DAPA be used in patients of heart failure with diabetes? Certainly, we have now documented evidence that DAPA benefits patients of heart failure, whether you are diabetic or non-diabetic, the benefit is similar. So diabetes does not come in way of uh, use in heart failure. Certainly you can use it. And there's no hypoglycemia in patients uh, when you are using in uh, non-diabetic patients, because that is often a scare. Uh, this I have already replied. This is again a very interesting question from uh, Dr. Nimisha Sina. Up to what level of EGFR you can use RNA in heart failure? The usual cutoff point, as we said, is 30. But whenever a patient has a GFR in the borderline, now trials have been initiated even up to 30. Our attempt is first to decongest the heart by drugs of modalities which do not affect the potassium levels or EGFR. 
For example, if you have a patient of heart failure with CKD, we'll try to decongest with use of, uh, say, nitrates plus hydalogen combination or use inotropes or uh, even vasodilators. And once the cardiac output improves, uh, we can initiate drugs, drugs. And when these drugs are initiated, you can see when the cardiac output improves, the EGFR also improves because heart failure and kidney failure are a uh, uh, vicious circle. They are uh, very closely interconnected. So our aim is always and always to use RNA in patients with heart failure so that this is the way we try to initiate RNA after we have decongested the heart failure. We have improved the cardiac output. This will also improve the renal functions and even the EGFR may come down. And when you add RNA, the EGFR after an initial increment will go down further and then it will remain stable. And those who are working in the nephrology department, they use even in dialysis patient because there's no problem. They can dialyze the patient in the event of uh, hyperkalemia. Hyperkalemia is a threat uh, when we are using RD in patient with CKD, but in nephrology units is used in patients with uh, dialysis because it is the important drug which prevents cardiovascular death. Most of the patient of CKD will die of a cardiovascular death and RD is one drug which decreases cardiovascular death. So that is the reason we always want RNA to be used in patients with CKD, always taking uh, precautions of hyperkalemia and acute kidney injury. Uh, this is Dr. Agrawal. What is the significance of SGLT2 inhibitors in relation to BNP and anti BNP? Now, if you are trying to assess heart failure in a patient who is on RNA, uh, never use BNP because RNA increases uh, BNP level. So patient with RNA, please use uh, anti bro NP. That is, uh, RNA is not reliable. Uh, currently, biomarkers are used for diagnosis of heart failure, for uh, judging the prognosis, for initiating treatment, for deciding the optimum time of discharge. So they are used in all stages of heart failure. Uh, serum markers are very useful in patients with heart failure. They help us a lot. Sometimes uh, when there is a problem in diagnosis of HEPF, uh, particularly when echocardiography is not available, uh, this may be utilized to differentiate whether the patient is suffering from heart failure or from a lung disease. So this has uh, immense value. Serum markers are good in heart failure. Uh, Dr. Srivastava, when do you initiate RNA and when do you initiate SGLT2 DAPA in non diabetic patients with heart failure? Now, one thing you must always understand that in heart failure, combination therapy, combination therapy, and combination therapy is the rule. You must try to use all mortality reducing drugs because each one of them has an incremental benefit. So if it is a non-diabetic patient, we may, in some circumstances, decide to use DAPA first or uh, ARNI first. Now, if there's a problem of EGFR, suppose EGFR is borderline and there is a tendency for hyperkalemia or borderline hyperkalemia, we would like to initiate DAPA because it doesn't affect. And when the cardiac function improves, we like to initiate ARNI. If blood pressure is not a problem, so blood pressure is not a problem or patient is not symptomatic, uh, from even border range, maybe 90 by 60, then we will initiate RNA also. So when to initiate RNA, when to initiate DAPA may differ. The sequence of initiation may differ, but ultimately our aim is to have all these drugs on the board because all of them have incremental benefit and heart failure has a malignant progression. The five-year mortality in diabetic heart failure is 85%. In non-diabetic is 50%. So combination therapy, all drugs to be initiated as and when possible. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Bhatia. What are the most common causes of heart failure? In our day-to-day -day practice, uh, we see uh, heart failure due to diabetes, heart failure due to hypertension, coronary artery disease, cardiomyopathies. So these are some of the important causes of heart failure. Uh, uh, 
how do you monitor heart failure at home uh, in the western countries there are various monitoring devices but indian countries uh, their use is meager uh, then there are telephonic consultations and consultations on the internet but india uh, these devices uh, are not in practice at the present state of time but i am sure they will be utilized uh, the whole idea of these is try to find out whether the patient is get gaining weight some of the device even tell about the pulmonary capillary pressure so you can increase the dose of diuretic so just inform the treating physician what is happening to the patient and drugs can be initiated uh, early enough so that the patient does not deteriorate and does not uh, get hospitalized they are useful in preventing hospitalization for the uh, heart failure by initiating treatment in early phase Uh, this is Dr. Agarwal. What is the role of SGL T2 inhibitors in CKD without diabetes and heart failure? I think the DAPA CKD trial has been uh, terminated prematurely, and this has shown benefit even in non diabetic CKD. Any kidney disease which is proteinuric will have immense benefit. If proteinuria is not there, the magnitude of benefit is much small. But whether it is a non-diabetic proteinuric kidney disease or a diabetic proteinuric kidney disease, uh, the benefit is always there. So it is proteinuria which decides because these drugs, they decrease the intergomular pressure. Once you decrease intergomular pressure, then the proteinuria decreases. And all of us know if there's proteinuria, proteinuria hastens the progress of uh, CKD. So non-diabetic kidney disease, the DAPA CKD trial has been positive. Yeah. Uh, this again is a very good question. What is asymptomatic left ventricular dysfunction? Now, as I already told you, there are four stages of heart failure. Stage A, you have only risk factor. You, you get your echocardiogram normal. Stage B, you have changes in your heart, but you are asymptomatic. And if you detect heart failure at this stage, use drugs like beta blockers, AC inhibitors, and other drugs, you can postpone the deterioration in left ventricle dysfunction. So recognition of asymptomatic left ventricle systolic dysfunction is very important, and patient must be strictly emphasized that you have to use drug, otherwise it will hasten death. When you start initiating these drugs, which I've told you, in the symptomatic phase, the longevity of life cannot be increased to a greater extent compared when you initiate in the asymptomatic. So initiation of asymptomatic phase uh, with all these drugs will increase your longevity of life to a much greater, and they should be initiated if you have asymptomatic left ventricle systolic dysfunction, beta blocker, SARNI, and now we have DAPA and all these drugs. They will immensely change your prognosis in the long run. What is the difference between acute and chronic heart failure? Chronic heart failure means the, all these uh, hemodynamic process and symptoms occur gradually. Acute means the patient suddenly get admitted in acute decompensated heart failure. And uh, besides decongestive therapy and other modalities, uh, now we have another new drug, ARNI, which has seen that once the hemodynamic stability is achieved, which means the patient is no longer requiring inotropes, no longer requiring intravenous diuretics, his blood pressure has been stable for 6 to 12 or 24 hours, you can initiate ARNI also. It is seen that if ARNI is initiated in hospitalization, the compliance is better, the magnitude of uh, benefit is also better. So acute heart failure, these drugs, uh, so also applies for SGLT2 inhibitors. These drugs are not to be used in the acute decompensation stage. After the hemodynamics are stabilized, these drugs are very useful and you can initiate after three, four days. And it is better to initiate in the hospital where the hemodynamics have been stabilized rather than patient goes because adherence is less and patient may not take with the drug. And the magnitude of benefit is also more it is seen when you initiate during the hospitalization.
this is from dr bhavan what is the role of bnp and anti bnp now as i have already told that these markers are commonly utilized in our day to day practice of heart failure if heart failure is in doubt particularly heart failure with preserved ejection fraction particularly if you are not having access to echocardiography it may at times be difficult whether the shortness of breath with the patient is due to a heart failure due to a lung disease or some other disease and if the levels are increased uh, it will go in favor of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction the diagnosis of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction is usually straightforward uh, because uh, it is easier to diagnose by the clinical signs and like hept which has lot of medics secondly they are used to assess the response to treatment they are used to assess the appropriateness of the timing of discharge and in the long term follow up they are again useful so they have multiple uses they are useful throughout the natural history of heart failure if the patient is an rne please do not use bnp because bnp is increased by rne and you will have uh, uh, wrong information that your heart failure is bursting due to increase in uh, bnp levels you should use anti br anti pro bnp if the patient is on rne that you must always remember now icd is very useful in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction if your ejection fraction is less than 35% uh this becomes an indication for icd say following myocardial infarction but because this is a costly device it is not uh, used in large numbers in the indian context but it should be used very very useful for secondary prevention secondary prevention means patient is already in episode of ventricular tachycardia and ventricular fibrillation this is an absolute indication those patients who have left ventricular dysfunction less than 35 this is also an important indication but uh, the uh, patient agreeing for an icd uh, many times there are problem because patient has not suffered from an episode of, but it should be used if there are no financial concern uh, dapa and rne have uh, delayed the initiation of device therapy because both these drugs uh, if you remember rne also decreases sudden cardiac death dapa uh, also postpones uh, the development of hospitalization for heart failure so both these drugs are postponing device therapy particularly those which improve uh, uh, heart failure uh, say crt or albedo even cardiac transplantation it has been seen in the arni trial that the use of device therapy was also decreased uh, it also reflected in the icd uh this is dr muthi can we start dapa without using arni i already told you the sequence of initiation of dapa arni or that that depends on the subset of patient there is no hard and fast rule that you have to use arni first you have to use dapa later on you have to do dapa first or arni depending on the subset for example your blood pressure is not a problem your egfr is not a problem you can initiate arni if there's hyperkalemia there's a borderline gfr there's a problem of hypotension or bottle life then you can initiate dapa so sequence of initiation may be different but our attempts to have all these drugs on the board you can in a diabetic patient you can initiate dapa stage a b c d all stages is useful even in stage you can initiate dapa ventricular assist device is a device which is utilized in patients with refractory heart failure it is either utilized as a bridge to transplant those patients of heart failure who are not responding to all possible treatments continue to remain in heart failure and uh, if you do echocardiography uh, they show persistent restrictive function these are the candidates for left ventricular assist devices so many times uh, the donor for heart transplant is not available so elvet is used as a bridge to transplant the patient is on elvet and when the donor comes he is put on a transplant device the second indication currently is they are also used as destination therapy 
because with advancement and refinements in the techniques of LVAD, uh, this is now also being used as destination therapy, and this uh, facility is also in available in India, and patients survive for a couple of years, even when it's used as destination therapy. And sometimes if the patient has a reversible cause of heart failure, say a cardiomyopathy, and if it shows regression reversal, uh, then it may be uh, removed from the patient. But otherwise, these are the two principal uses, either as a destination therapy or as a bridge to transplant. Bridge to recovery, as we said, you are lucky if your heart failure was having, a, say, viral myocarditis, it recovers or whatever maybe then it may be used as a bridge to recovery also or okay crt cardiac uh, resynchronization therapy dr krishna now this is a therapy which is being utilized for those patients who have uh, complete left ventral branch block and are in pale, heart failure with due injection fraction it resynchronizes the ventricle. There are two pacing leads. One is placed in the right atrium, other is placed in the left ventricle and at an appropriate site. And when this device works, uh, it resynchronizes the ventricle and uh, the cardiac output improves, the mitral regurgitation decrease. That is called CRT, resynchronization therapy. LBB makes the ventricle desynchronous. The prognosis of patients of heart failure, this is from uh, Dr. Maheshwari. As already said, heart failure, once sets in, runs a malignant progression with a very high morbidity and mortality. If you are a diabetic, the five-year survival is only 15%. If you are a non-diabetic, the five-year survival is 50%. But if you initiate these uh, newer therapies, it is seen that you may have an improvement in the projected survival by five to six years, so that if you use all these therapies, say at the age of uh, 55 years, the projective survival improved by five to six years. So optimizing uh, management of heart failure with all these therapies will improve the long-term prognosis. And as we said, never de-escalate therapy in heart failure, even if the symptoms are less, the treatment of heart failure is escalation, escalation, escalation. If you de-escalate, the patient will suddenly deteriorate and we will collapse. So there we can now, we are now powered to improve uh, the prognosis of uh, heart failure in the current era due to these new drugs and even devices play a very important role. Uh, this is from uh, Dr. Deepthi. What causes increase in the left ventricle chamber stiffness in the pathophysiology? Now, whenever you have uh, this increased stiffness, it produces a diastolic heart failure, or we call it as half pep. The heart failure is primarily because the ventricle is not able to relax. This may be due to left ventricular hypertrophy due to any cause. Commonly, it is hypertension. You may have an hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, or there may be infiltrative cardiomyopathy like amyloidosis. And there are many other causes. So if the heart or the left ventricle has become stiff due to infiltration, due to hypertrophy, due to fibrosis, it fails to relax. And this results in uh, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Because when the blood comes, it cannot accommodate. So it produces pulmonary edema. It cannot go forward. So it accumulates. So that is half pep. Uh, this is again Dr. Agarwal. What is the role of hydrology in a nitrate when these are used in heart failure? As we said, if your renal function is normal, we always try to use uh, RAS blockers, including ARNI also. But we have lots of patients of CKD associated with heart failure where the EDFR is 30 or maybe less than this, where if you use RAS blockers, if you use ARNI, your uh, EGFR may deteriorate, you may also have an acute kidney injury. To avoid the acute kidney injury, this is a serious complication. Never forget, if you have an acute kidney injury, whatever glomeruli are affected, they are lost forever. Recovery from acute injury does not mean that the glomeruli which were affected have regained, they will never regain. So acute kidney, so to prevent this acute injury, we use drugs like hydralazine and nitrates which decongest the heart, hydrogen decreases afterload, nitrate decreases preload predominantly. So when you use these patients in patients with CKD, 
uh, the heart stroke volume and cardiac output improves once this improves uh, the kidney blood flow also increases and the EF GFR may also improve and then you can initiate these RAS blockers in early. So that is the use of hydalogene and nitrates and that it's also used in uh, black patients where uh, uh, RAS blockers do not produce favorable effects, but that is not applicable to me. Is there any study, this is from Dr. Murthy, which documents ICD is postponed? Now, DAPA-HF is a recent trial, no study has been done. Ideally, I think in the present era of ARNI and DAPA, one should revise the indications of CRT and indications of ICD. But I don't think this will be done. But it is quite logical uh, that uh, you may delay uh, implantation of these devices, particularly devices which improve uh, left ventricular dysfunction. ICD, we know ARNI, uh, the use of uh, ARNI in the paradigm trial did not show any increase in the use of ICD compared to the uh, placebo arm. So ICD were not increased in the ARNI trial, paradigm trial. But we do not have any documented trial. Uh, this is from Dr. Das. Why should I, what should I do if the symptoms suddenly get worse? You should uh, hospitalize. You are mostly suffering from uh, acute decompensated heart failure and be under the supervision of a cardiologist. This is an emergency, you must get hospitalized and they will treat according to the cause of heart failure and your features. But you must get if the symptoms suddenly worse, please do not remain at home. The mortality benefit and the symptomatic benefit is much higher if you're in the hospital rather than at home, must get hospitalized. This is the last, yeah. I'm sure the, you had enjoyed the information given by me on heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. All of us know currently we have five pillars of heart failure, uh, ACE, ARB, we have beta blockers, we have MRAs, we have RNA, and the new pillar is uh, DAPA glyphosate. But for heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, we are in, still in the search of a positive trial and SGLT2 is creating expectation that we may have a positive trial. The other big message is heart failure, one sets in runs a malignant progression. Pharmacotherapy can only blood this malignant progression. It does not arrest the malignant progression and therefore prevention, prevention should be the goal. And this is a very important goal. You must stress on prevention of heart failure because if you become a patient of heart failure, your long-term prognosis is compromised. And as already said, Combination therapy should be the rule. When you're treating heart failure, you should become uh, oncologist. Oncology, we have combination therapy. You should use combination therapy. Never de-escalate therapy. And if you want to de-escalate therapy, particularly in patients with peripartic cardiomyopathy, uh, you must have a normal ejection fraction and also a normal GLS. Otherwise, never de-escalate therapy. Usually, there's resistance. What are the enemies of heart failure? Usually, there's resistance from the patient, from the attendant, sometimes even from the physician. Please do not add on drug. I, my shortness of breath is much better. Don't listen to them. This is the biggest problem in the management of heart failure. You have to sequentially use all drugs, escalate, escalate, and use all drugs because each has an incremental benefit. Suppose you drug A and then you B, incremental benefit, and so on. So multiple combinations should be used, but prevention should be the goal. And as our age is advancing, the longevity is advancing, heart failure is increasing uh, day by day, and the number of heart failure patients are progressively increasing. And with better treatment of coronary artery disease, the patients are surviving long, but all of them ultimately come with heart failure. So heart failure is globally, as well as in Indian countries, is a great problem, and we must declare a war against heart failure. Thank you very much. It's from the world's best medical minds. You are watching the right doctors.com.